Today we're realizing that our waterways need to be protected from the things that we do. With Puget Sound, ultimately we have got an opportunity here. We have five species of Pacific salmon. We have 10 species of marine mammals, including uh, the iconic orca whales, which are, are suffering right now. Uh, and this is on us. This is our chance to protect that. Ever since American settlers began to populate the Puget Sound, the health of the Sound has been at risk. Human waste, fertilizer runoff, vehicular toxins, and discharge and drainage from industrial facilities all have negatively impacted the Sound. In October of 2017, the Seattle Times reported that, despite the state government pouring millions of dollars into restoration projects for natural streams and spawning locations, 10 to 40% of the coho salmon die before they can even spawn because of pollution. The Puget Sound is unique in the United States due to its deep and narrowing geography, inland extent, wide range of depths, and urbanized watersheds and shorelines. Almost 4 million people live around the Sound, and numerous streams and rivers feed into the oceanic inlet going to take the whole region to protect and preserve the waters of Puget Sound and that includes the marine waters and all of the tributary waters. Not to mention the millions of aquatic creatures and plant life that thrive in the Sound. Various breeds of salmon, marine invertebrate, and predatory animals dwell within the waters and rivers of the inlet. Harbor seals and orca are among the most famous but are also in the most danger. But what steps have been taken to protect human and aquatic life and sustain the Puget Sound? In early 2018, Governor Inslee signed an executive order creating Southern Resident Killer Whale Recovery Task Force. This task force was appointed with the duty of developing long-term policies for orca recovery and future sustainability. The task force also has jurisdiction of the overall health of the Puget Sound. After six months of work, the task force has accumulated 36 recommendations for the Department of Ecology and State Government. These recommendations called for measures such as decreased noise from vessels and reduced exposure of contaminants to orcas and the Chinook salmon that they eat. We have some serious issues with our waterways here. Our waterways are beautiful, but we have some pollution problems. And it shows up in health advisories and the, the fish catches. It shows up in uh, our beleaguered orca whale population, which is uh, endangered. Toxic chemicals enter the sound in a steady release from everyday products, such as softeners and plastics, roofing materials, and acidification from deforestation. As we use and dispose of these products, the toxic chemicals they contain can enter rivers, lakes, and the sound itself. I would say that actually the challenges have only probably become more evident to us in recent years. In our large urban areas, we have a lot of redevelopment occurring. And many of those sites, the original organization that was there could have been you know, operating in a way that actually put pollutants into the soils that the building sat on. Those are going to be sites that we, as we redevelop, we need to clean them up. Low levels of dissolved oxygen combined with high levels of nitrogen can suffocate marine life. Though there are some natural influences that can lower oxygen levels, many human-generated nitrogen sources contribute to the problem. Some sources include heavy fertilizer use, livestock manure, septic systems, and wastewater treatment plants. The nitrogen and the phosphorus and things that go into the water is basically fertilizing Puget Sound and that causes low oxygen events, it reduces light penetration and ability for seagrasses to grow, which ultimately impacts habitat for salmon and food for orca whales. In 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed by Congress. The Clean Water Act requires that combined sewer overflow, or CSOs, occur no more than once per outfall per year. A CSO is comprised of pipelines that carry both wastewater and stormwater together 
Well, the number one source of toxic pollution to Puget Sound is stormwater runoff. Um, and this is the rainfall and sometimes snow melt uh, that rolls off of our rooftops, our parking lots, our driveways, our roadways, and our highways. Um, it contains more tonnage of toxic pollutants than any other source. There's also many, many pipes. So we're now talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pipes all around Puget Sound. It's a diverse um, pollution source, but it is regulated by the Clean Water Act. Anytime there's a pipe, it is classified as a point source of pollution. And that's one of the tools that gives us the ability to uh, stand up for the protection of our waterways. We have municipal stormwater permits, which helps remove uh, toxins and pollutants from our hardened surfaces and puts in low impact development. Those do a great job of helping to reduce the number of uh, toxins that are going into our water bodies. In accordance with both state and federal law, these cities are required to reduce overflow of CSOs through improved management practices, proper operational programs, and long-term sustainability. But one question remains, how can the average person get involved in helping the sound? I think people being aware of the types of things that they put down the drain is, is helpful. Uh, when they wash their car, um, don't wash it on the hard you know, surface. Put it onto a lawn or put it someplace where you can use the grass or soil and surrounding areas to filter out any of the oil grease grime that's coming off their car. Puget Sound's really big, but find out what's happening in the creek by your house. Join a, a creek restoration group. Uh, go on patrol with Puget Sound Keeper. And the next time they need you in Olympia, uh, when there's a Department of Ecology permit, or there's a, a, new, a new item that needs public comment, uh, that's the time for people to stand up and get involved. We need to mimic the, what nature does in a more pristine environment where water is filtered through plants and root systems and compost and soil. That's far cheaper than building complex systems of pipes and treatment systems and things like that. Um, and it can be done as we build new projects, but we also have to get to retrofitting our existing infrastructure, which has a, has a healthy price tag associated with it. I would say that we are in a great time and we live in a great state. Our state leads the nation in stormwater management. We um, are environmentally progressive in this state. So to me, we have all the recipes in this state to be successful. We have the political will, we have the uh, regulations and statutes already in place to help get us there. Um, and we have a, you know residents that want to protect it. there's a lot of power granted to uh, citizens and community members uh, to enforce the provisions of the Clean Water Act. The other thing to remember is that our waterways are public. No one has a right to own or destroy them. Uh, every citizen, every community member has a right to clean water. With every waking day, new opportunities arise to mitigate the unfortunate consequences of industrial progress. When environmental challenges threaten the Puget Sound, there will always be federal agencies, community organizations, and mindful citizens that will help the Sound thrive for generations to come.